Hey everyone, this is Steve Weintraub with Collider, and I am here with Kevin Smith. <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming in. I kept this up like hoping for applause, <laughs> and in the back there was a light mule of, yay. <laughs> See? See? Right. I'm trained well. Have there you, it is. Have you been here? Do you know what the Schmodown is? I know what the Schmodown is, but I've, I've never been here. Uh, for years, I've threatened uh, our good friend John Schnepp about coming to a Schmodown, coming over here. Uh, but I've not, I'm familiar with it, but I've never been on it. I, I think I would be good at it. A lot of people ask me and Mark Bernardin to do it together. I think Mark Bernardin might have done it from Fat Man on Batman. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you now that if you like applause, which yes. I think you do. I do. Um, I live for it. I'm, I'm like, it's all, I don't fuck the, fuck the money. I'm here for the <laughs> approval. And then, you know, is I was raised a fat kid, so naturally applause mean nothing but good to me. That's I, my currency. I will say that I think at some point you should come in and at least sit in and be like a judge or I can't do that. It. Can I compete? Oh, 100%. I like, can, I, I I can make that I can't stand in judgment of others. The guy who made Yoga Hosers can't stand the judgment of others for the rest of his life but i could compete like i, I love that shit let me tell you something um we're going to talk about this once this is done yes. because i think you would be great and you would get a lot of applause i would happily do it uh, by virtue of the fact that i've now learned where this place is it took <laughs> me a fucking red hot byzantine minute to find it and when i saw burbank i was like oh i know burbank apparently i don't know burbank not it's this a, area it's a big city it's a big city but uh, now that i know how to get here I, i'd do it in a heartbeat all right so jumping into why i get to talk to you today okay um Talk a little bit about Rivet TV and how you got involved because the, the, the pilot you shot was like from 2016. Yeah, we shot this pilot for this show called uh, Hollywood back in like 2016, January of 2016, right before we went to Sundance with Yoga Hosers that year. So it was like two weeks before we went to Sundance. So we shot it with a company called Fremantle with the idea that they'll shop it to the world and find a home in the traditional kind of make a pilot way. But in the traditional kind of, hey, we made a pilot and nobody wanted it way, which is you know predominantly what it is out here. Out of 100% of pilots get made, 10% is what we see or whatever. We fell into that other 90 where people were like, oh, it's a weed show, I get it, next, you know, and move the fuck on. There was a disjointed, I guess, had been set up at Netflix, so a lot of people were like, we got one, that's good. So there was no home for Hollywood. And it sat on my laptop forever. And, you know, I'd watch it from time to time because, and this is going to sound narcissistic as shit, I'm not used to acting with words when I act. It's usually a lot of big-eyed acting and stuff as Silent Bob. So in this thing, I got to, like, act. Like, when I, made, when I wrote Clerks, the role of Randall, I wrote for myself, which is why he has all the best jokes. But as we got close to production, you know, crippling uh, self-doubt grabbed me and was like, you're not an actor. Why do you think you could do this? Which is weird because it didn't grab me about directing. Like, I wasn't a director either. I'd never done anything. Why did I feel like, well, that made more sense. I'd seen Richard Linklater do it. I've read about, like, Hal Hartley at that point. It seemed like there was a roadmap I could follow. But, like, for me to act, I'm like, you're no actor and shit. Acting in high school don't count. Like, give it to somebody better. Gave it to Jeff Anderson. And then wound up playing Silent Bob. So what Hollyweed felt like to me was like, oh, shit, it's a second bite at the apple where you get to be a you know, a clerk on camera again, and you get to do it with words and shit. Because I'll be honest with you, maybe it's a good thing that Jeff Anderson wound up playing Randall and it wasn't me, because if it was me, what, no doubt we'd be on Clerks 29 right about now. <laughs> I would have made 29 of those motherfuckers if I was the one in charge and it was like, oh, it's me, let's do it again. So it was nice to do this, but then nobody wanted it. And I'm a real manufacturer for use kind of cat. Like uh, uh, Jordan uh, Monsanto, Jason Muse's wife, she runs our company. Uh, oh, many times over the last two years, I was always like, I'm gonna put this up on a YouTube channel just so people could see it. Like it's fun and stuff. And she's like, no, wait, hold on to it. It could, there could be a play. And I'd toy with in the back of my mind, like maybe we shoot like 45 minutes more, an hour more take it as a feature to film festivals or something like that. Something to get around to. And then Rivet TV popped up um, and it was right after my heart attack. So I was real amenable to a lot of things and whatnot. So Rivet TV, uh, we knew Marcus who works over there. We'd worked with him when he was at Fox uh, doing this program called the Short Comms, which was a cool idea that never went anywhere. So Marcus run is running Rivet uh, TV. And he reached out and he was like, do you want to shoot a pilot for us? Our model here is we have a show, we get a bunch of people to pre-buy the season, and then we go forward and stuff. 
And so we were like, well, I don't really want to direct somebody else's pilot, but we got a pilot and nobody ever saw. Here, check this out. We gave Marcus Hollyweed and he loved it. He's like, oh my God, why didn't you keep going? I was like, nobody wanted it and stuff. And he's like, well, we'll what we want it. And he told us all about the model, the idea is you put it out there, 45 days, people can watch a full pilot. It's not like when you do Kickstarter or Indiegogo, there's a video about like, this is what it'll be. Like we here, this is what it is. So you give a better idea of like whether you want to back it or not. And instead of multiple tiers where you can give like lots of money, it's really very simple. One ninety nine up through like five ninety nine pay per episode. We get enough of those together aggregated, we get to go make six more episodes. So, you know, they're a tech company and, and luckily luckily enough we stumbled into one another and we kind of got to be the the test case, the ones that that go first. And you know, I got an audience that that likes me. I don't know if we got enough to get to to our goal. It's 5.3 million bucks, but I think we'll get there. Um, I, I, I know, uh, like, you know, the cats that do like me would be amenable. Like, oh, shit, you want to make six of these? Fuck, let's do it. So we're trying it to see if it works. I've never, I stayed away from crowdsource financing on any of the movies and stuff. And then when I walked through this with uh, Rivet, it, I was like, oh, this isn't crowdsource finance. This is literally like people going like, I'll buy this show. And if enough people buy it, then we make the show. <laughs> so I, I don't know, I'm excited about it. Number one, I'm excited the pilot got out and people got to see it. Um, even if we don't go the next step, like if we miss our goal and stuff, at least that it finally got out into the world. But I think we might actually get to kind of go and make six more. And, you know, it's like I easily could have just for the last two years and change, except to the fact that like you made your shit, nobody wanted it. But thankfully, we live in the world that we live in now where it's like you can really micro target a niche audience. You don't have to get everybody. I don't have to convince ABC that making a sitcom set in a weed store with two middle-aged men is a good idea. It's like, I just have to convince enough people who'll pre-buy the show and then boop, we could go do it. Completely. It's, uh, it's interesting too, because with all the legalization that's happened over the last two years, mm. you would think that there is, I mean, I've heard this weed thing is popular. They tell me. Right. I'm not sure if it's going to catch on. Right. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting, though, that there aren't more shows or mm. more things in this. Uh, I mean, you look at Weeds on Showtime. Yeah, they had you know? like, they have what, six, seven seasons they went? Actually, it was uh, 29. <laughs> I think they went that long. I think you're right. Um, it, yeah, it, I think when most people think of like Weeds something, you know, they assume it's going to be a lot of, like, he, 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 and it's not. Like, in my thing, if you look at, like, the movies we used to do in the 90s, everyone smoked cigarettes because I, I was a cigarette smoker there, and a lot of the people who were in the movies smoked cigarettes. So we, we weren't, like, the movies weren't about smoking cigarettes. That was just kind of background. That was just some shit the actors did with their hands while they were saying some things. Same thing here. Like, it's not like weed's the engine that drives the stories. It's just, like, the same way, like, you know, uh, Hershey's or Pringles or, you know, ice cream weren't the driving uh, factor of clerks just because we were in a convenience store. Like being in a weed store, oddly enough, doesn't mean that like every plot sur it re it revolves around weed. It's just kind of like their uh, background, to me at least, um, because that's what it is in my life. It's so much a part of my life. It would be like making a show about breathing. Like, you know, I'm like, I breathe, so everyone does. I assume everyone smokes weed. So the idea of making a show in that space, I think it's tricky. You can't just do, like, you can't do what Cheech and Chong did in the 70s. They've already done that and stuff. So you got to find a new way to do it. There's a show on HBO that's really clever. That I forget what it's called. Uh, that They came from a web show as well. Uh, that's about the weed business and it's way smarter than the average bear ours is not smart Hollyweed is like not, certainly I wouldn't call it smart by any stretch of the imagination It's certainly not groundbreaking That's why I literally sell it as it's like clerks in a weed store with two other guys um, It's fun more than anything else and for me I, you know, it's another way to exercise the creative muscle. I went like that as if that was jerking off. Uh, to, to be an actor, to pretend to, to act with words or something. Do, do you already, now mind you, you don't have the money yet, but have you already been spinning? Like, I, if I did six episodes, these are what they would be. Yes, yes. And that's something I didn't, you know, in the beginning, I, I, back when we made the pilot two and a half years ago, of course, the, the future is always a play in your head. Then when we found no home for it, I stopped thinking about the future of Hollyweed other than like, well, we should finish it one day. And now that there's a possibility we get to make six more, like I, I jumped the gun. I wrote two more scripts last week where I'm like, this is what I'd like to do, which is easy because Donnell is my partner in the show, Donnell Rawlings. 
And Donnell is a comedian and he's a storyteller to begin with. So everything doesn't have to be generated by me. Like I went to his stand up at the Laugh Factory two weeks ago and after the show I was like, I'm gonna borrow this bit and this bit and this bit and dramatize them in the script and then we'll have story credit together and stuff. He was like, fantastic. And I'll break him off some loot. So the idea of like, I, I think the credit that I wrote for episodes two and three it was uh, stories by uh, Donnell, Donnell Rawlings and Kevin Smith and then teleplay by Kevin Smith. So having somebody to lean on and be like, hey man, tell me a funny story. And he gives you a funny story. I'm like, oh Christ, I can build a whole episode around that. He does this great bit about going to jail. If you ever see him, he's just like, he's on stage, Donnell. And he's like, I went to jail, I did a hard time. 22 hours and then he goes into the story about going to jail once for like a minute so i was like let's do that in the episode you want to redo it and he's like absolutely so i don't know it's fun it's collaborative as well like it's not just me going like this is everything that's in my head about weed stories I i'm i'm kind of bringing in like somebody else's head more head i know that sounds like an empty promise but uh I, be, I definitely want to touch on, normally I don't ask about how people are quote unquote doing, Yes. but obviously everyone knows what happened to you physically. Um, and I'm so happy that you are uh, <laughs> still you. around. Thank you. Um, As I tell pe people, t people have been really nice, man, because it happened like five months ago. People are like, oh my God, I'm so happy you're here. And like, I'm always like, oh my God, me too. But it was just a weird response, but it's, but it's kind of true. People have been super nice. I, I honestly, I'm a creature of the internet. So I assumed that when I nearly died, some of the internet would be like, I wish he'd fully died. I wish he'd gone silent Bob forever, fucking fat prick. But that didn't happen. Like, and I was looking for it. I was served, I'm sure, you know, somewhere in Fortran, there's a lot of it. I'm not saying it doesn't exist anywhere in the world, but all the places that I frequent online, it didn't really happen. And then that was like, it was a real Ebenezer Scrooge moment where I was like, oh my God, like, you know, hey boy, go get a Christmas goose when I woke up the next morning because I, I you know, I just expected worse of people, I guess, in terms of like having spent uh, my, the entire life of the internet on the internet. Sure. And it didn't happen. So like that was one of those, uh, wow, like I, not only did I escape death, but like I came back to the land of the living with like a slightly better perspective in terms of like, oh, like, People aren't as bad as all that. Like, oh, no, sure. no, they're, they're that bad. I, well, I, just stay, I stay away from the political page, but it, it, like in entertainment and, and fandom, it was been pretty good. Did you do anything after surviving? Yes. Did because a lot of things. Took shit, <laughs> masturbated, called my mother, told her I love her. <laughs> there are a lot of things I did, Steve. <laughs> right. Um, but in all seriousness, yes. you had an event happen to you that yes. like 99 out of 100 people don't survive. It's real high. Don't say it like that. That was that, now I'm scared. It's 20 percent. The guy told me. The doctor told me on the table. He's like, uh, "You're having a, a heart attack." That when I first got to the ER, I had no idea. I was like, "What?" Nobody had mentioned like that possibility. I just couldn't catch my breath. So honestly, I thought they were going to be like, "You smoke too much weed today." I was like, "I know." But it wasn't that guy goes, you're having a massive heart. He goes, what's your, how do you feel? Scale of one to 10, what's your pain level? And I was like, negative three. And he's like, you're doing this wrong. I said, doing what wrong? He's like, you're in the middle of a massive heart attack. You should be in much more pain than that. And I was like, what do you mean, massive heart attack? And he's like, you're having a massive heart attack right now. If it's what I think it is, uh, we gotta get you upstairs as quickly as possible. And they got me upstairs and they went up my groin and my, uh, the, up the femoral artery with a camera and stuff like that. And he's like, yeah, it's what I thought it was. You got 100% uh, blockage in your LAD. It's the artery that grows across the front of your heart. And I said, oh, what do we do? And he's like, well, we gotta go to work fast. He's going, I'm gonna put a stent in there. You know what that is? I said, my mother has a stent in one of the arteries in her heart. And he goes, oh, do you have a history of heart problems in your family? I said, no, I said, not at all. My mother has a stent, that's all. And my father died of a massive heart attack at 67. He's like, we have to work fast, Mr. Smith. So he goes, I just wanna tell you, he goes, you're a comic book guy. I said, I am. He goes, that artery, the LAD, we call it the widow maker. I said, really? And he goes, yeah, because in 20% of the cases of 100% blockage, the patient lives. Other 80%, patient dies. You got a 20% chance here. He's going, but I'm really good at my job, so I'm gonna get you there. And then he disappeared into my groin and made magic. Dr. Leidenheim, I always like to say his name because he saved my life. You know, it's like, like- uh, yeah, By the way, crazy. Isn't that nuts? Isn't that, and, and like, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in the world of fiction where I'm like, fucking Ant-Man got small, that's amazing. What's amazing is this guy went up my groin Literally saw, he's like, oh, fuck, you've, you've eaten too many little Debbie Swiss delights and now you're fucked, but I can fix you. And they put in this tiny ass, looks like the lead you put in one of those like lead pencils. 
into my artery and then expand it. It's this little mesh thing. Gets it through all the guck and shit. And, and they keep you awake through the whole procedure in twilight state so that you can talk to them. And I thought, like, when I came out of the procedure, my wife was just like, oh, my God, are you okay? And I was like, I'm fine, man. If that's a heart attack, give me another one. And she goes, what, are you on drugs? And I said, no, they didn't give me drugs. I did that whole thing sober. And the doctor's behind me going, he's on fentanyl right now. <laughs> so, you know, they have me packed with fentanyl. And they keep you awake so they can talk to you because they need you the present and stuff. So, you know, I was just rambling and singing theme song to Degrassi to these fools and shit. And then at one point, my man goes, okay, we're going to open it up, Kev. He's going, I'm going to count to three and open up the stent. You tell me if you feel any pressure relief, okay? I said, all right, Doc. He goes, one, two, three. And it was literally like somebody had lifted, uh, you know, uh, fucking New Jersey off of my chest physically. Like New Jersey had been on my chest, not a hockey crest, but just the whole state. Like suddenly I went, <gasps> And he goes, you know what that is? He's gone, your LAD was so blocked. It was like a balloon that was overinflated or a hose that you bend in half. is pushing your heart down against your lungs. So that's why you couldn't catch your breath. But I bet you could breathe now. I said, I could breathe very clearly now. He's like, yeah, we did it. You're part of the 20%. So honestly, like, and I'm no bullshit. You know, I just fucking, it happened. You live your life. And I wind up telling stories about it a lot. But, you know, back to work, like, within fucking a week or whatever. Because you know, the human race runs in one direction. And it never really occurs to me until like you said, like, you know, fucking, you're like one of the people that didn't die. Like that never occurs to me until that moment when you said that, I'm getting ready to answer the question in the back of my head. I was like, he's right. <laughs> you didn't die. You should do anything. You should do much more than you're doing now. Like a lot of people online asked me, they're like, or not asked me, they speculated. They were like, oh my God, now that he's survived this, I can't wait to see the next movie he makes because this is going to be profound, and it's not. It's Jay and Silent Bob reboot. There's nothing <laughs> profound about it. I've been planning it since before the heart attack. But people assume because you've lived, you're going to be somehow better at your job, but that's not really the case, except it does make you a little more fearless because you're like, oh, fuck, I might die. But to be fair, like the, for the guy who made Tusk, being fearless with the art was never really a problem. You know what I'm saying? But this thing with River TV... If they had asked me pre-heart attack, I'd been like, you know what? What if it don't work? What if we don't hit our number? That's going to be embarrassing. Like, fuck it. I, I can't risk that. Now that I almost died, I'm like, I don't give a shit. Let's do that. Because guess what? What's the worst thing that happens if this fails? People go like, fuck it, Kevin Smith didn't make another thing he said he was going to make. You know what the worst thing that happens in the other situation is? They put you in the fucking ground. So, like, I'll take a little possible humiliation for the chance at like doing something I would really enjoy doing. Like I like acting next to Donnell. I like the idea of like, all right, I'm gonna sit down and write a script that hasn't been clawing at my head and heart for years or for months or something like that. I'm just gonna sit down and write it because I gotta write six. Cause I'm never in episodic world, right? Like I'm always, you make a movie and it's like, here it is, ugh, one and done. And everything is right there. And fuck, I hope it works because we spend a lot of time in, in the world of episodic. If you make something bad, quote unquote bad, some people are like, this fucking sucks. One week, wait one week, there'll be another one. That's why I never feel bad about directing Supergirl or The Flash, right? I've done that three and three times a piece now. Because I'm like, I can't fuck this up. Even if I drop this Fabergé egg. Number one, there's so many people that work on it that you can't make a bad episode by yourself, right? So even if I did make an episode where people are like, this fucking sucks, it's the worst Flash ever made. All they have to do is wait one week and a good flash will show up. And then a week after that, another good flash. And they'll forget about what I did. In movie world, is you know, when you hang your entire reputation or two years on one effort, then you live with that stink for a while if people don't like it and shit. Mallrats came out in 1995 or 23 years from when Mallrats came out. I still think about Saturday morning when I was like, how much did it make? And they're like $400,000. I'm like, on one screen, we're geniuses. They're like, <laughs> on the entire continental United States. I was like, oh, shit. And all the reviews were terrible and shit. And then 10 years later, that's the movie that everyone's pat you on the back for. Like, that's the movie most people will come up to me and talk about. Like, oh, my God, fucking Mallrats, Brody Bruce. I was him and shit like that. So there's delayed gratification when you make a movie that doesn't connect with an audience until later on when you're a cult filmmaker. With episodic work, there's a more immediate sense of gratification, and there's also a, a better chance at getting it 
right. You know, Completely. I have to ask you. So yes. you, you survive. Yes. You get home. Was there something that you'd been thinking about, like, quote unquote, buying or doing or something you'd been like pushing off because you're like, I don't really need this. And then you survive and you're like, no, I need this. Yes, <laughs> there absolutely is. It's two examples of that. One happened and one I'm trying to make happen. Uh, Mike Esperanza, he's one of the Wonder Bros, he's got a brother named Matt. Uh, they're in Texas, painters. Uh, they do a lot of stuff you see online. They, they know a lot of movie makers because they have gone to like the Alamo Draft House to do uh, exhibits. Like we did a Smodcast live at the Alamo Draft House. I think it was in Houston. And they did like an art show. And so the boys had a lot of pieces there. So I've always loved their pieces. Uh, they'll do stuff like um, moment of uh, Silent Bob going through the air in the mall and mall rats and stuff. He does a painting of that. Paintings are fucking gorgeous, right? So I'm looking at Mike's art because it's hanging all over the house. And I go, there, there's a painting that I don't have. Most of the stuff hangs in the house, of course, revolves around our lives, me and my family. I said, but there's something missing, something on the wall that I like for, desperately need. So I wrote to Mike and I was like, hey man, I know you do these incredible lifelike paintings. Can I commission you to do a massive painting of the final image of the Bad News Bears, which is the team photo, when it's all done. When the movie's done, they freeze frame on the team photo. I said, this movie, I realize now that I almost died. I've always loved the Bad News Bears. Saw it in 1976, saw it before Star Wars, before, uh, you know, fucking, well, I knew the Justice League from Super Friends and shit like that. But I was coming off of uh, Snoopy fandom and Jaws fandom, and this was a minute before Star Wars would take over a young kid's life in the 70s. Bad News Bears was religion. Number one, of course, I wanted to be one of the Bears. Only played Little League for that reason and was terrible at it. That was the only thing I shared in common with the Bad News Bears. But number two, that movie taught my generation. I'm 47, I'm be 48 next month. You're younger than me. What are you, 30 something? Uh, I'm closer in age than you, I think. Is that right? Yeah. Um, okay, so my generation, like the next generation after us had Mighty Ducks. And the Mighty Ducks taught a disparate group of losers how to win sure. with class. Bad News Bears is a seminal formative film for those of my generation because it taught us the most important lesson you can ever teach a child in life, which is like, you won't always win. It's impossible. It's impossible to always win. You can be special, as Mr. Rogers taught us, and I saw that documentary recently, and it's fucking amazing. Yeah. But not everyone wins. And that, that movie put it on front street. Like you identify with these kids and you take the journey and un they take an unlikely turn and you're like, oh my God, the bears are gonna fucking pull it off and shit. And then in the last, you know, spoilers, five minutes of that movie, your heroes lose the game. And you know, that, that wasn't presented as, this only happens once in a lifetime, kids. That was fucking facts, that was reality. That movie held up a mirror to our entire culture in the mid 70s. We saw ourselves on the screen long before John Hughes showed us ourselves on the screen years later in the 80s with his teenage movies. My generation saw ourselves reflected in those kids on the Bears team, on North Valley Bears. Watching them lose was an important fucking thing to learn when you were a kid because you will lose more often in life than you will ever fucking win. And I say that as a guy who has won the, the lottery of life, made a fucking movie when he was a kid, and I'm still talking about it like 25 years later, and I managed to wring a career out of it even fucking a quarter century later on. But I've lost a lot. Like fucking, I've gone up the mall rats. I can, are you kidding me? I can give you a litany of the things that quote unquote didn't work based on what others have said or based on how I felt internally. But you never know. Like that's the weird thing. Like uh, life is not a finite game like fucking baseball or something like that where people go like, okay, here it is. Life goes on. Maybe they can give you a score at your end of your life and shit. But something that seems like a loss in one moment becomes like a victory later on through no fucking fault or, or intercession of your own, just as time and tide goes. So something that doesn't work years later works. You know, I had to eat shit on Jersey Girl for a long fucking time. Now online, if I make a joke at Jersey Girl's expense, there's a lot of fucking like, fuck you, that movie's good. I'm a single fi a parent and I went through that and all of a sudden you get in this incredible feedback and stuff. You know, the way movies are built, it's like everybody gotta go this weekend or else it don't fucking work or else like, you know. Well, that's changing a little bit. A Little bit, right? Episodic TV though is more like, 
Just keep it coming, man. Like, they think in terms of seasons, right? They don't think in terms of single episodes unless nobody remembers, remembers horrible episodes as much as they remember great episodes. And they'll remember bad seasons or I don't like this season as much as that season stuff. But it's a different curve that you get graded on. So anyway, back to the fucking Bad News Bears thing. I learned to lose and be a loser because of the Bad News Bears. So I said to Mike, can you paint that for me? I commissioned him to do it. There was this one moment where I was considering having myself painted onto the team. <laughs> and then my wife goes, that's too creepy. Just get the team. Don't put yourself on the team, Kevin. And so I left myself off it. He sent it last week, and it is fucking breathtaking, even if you're not a Bad News Bears fan. I, I hope uh, one day, 500 years from now, somebody uncovers this and is just like, this belongs in a museum, a young Indiana Jones and shit, and it hangs in the Louvre. It's you, a gorgeous piece. I think you should talk to Lucas about his museum that's coming to LA. <laughs> exactly. It would totally go, it'd be at home in a place like that. That is one thing that I was like, I gotta do this. Uh, the other thing is uh, my friend JC owns a bar in Hollywood, uh, the Scum and Villainy Cantina, which sure. is a geek bar, man. It's a, your friendly neighborhood geek bar. And he slowly, I've worked with JC for years, like he shoots a lot of the things we do and whatnot. He's worked with us on the movies. Uh, I remember when he was putting this thing together, he's like, I'm building a pop-up bar. And I was like, what? I'm not a drinker, so like bars go over my head. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, a pop-up bar, like a themed bar. We're gonna do this theme bar. It's kind of like, you know, Star Wars-ish or something like that. And uh, I kept like tabs on it from a distance and like he would update me and be like, uh, we sold a bunch of tickets because they were meant to do it for like two months and then stops. So they pre-sold tickets and shit. And he's like, we sold out, so we're going to extend it another month. And then he got to a place where he was like, I think I'm going to make a, try to make a go of it. Like, I think we're going to try to just keep it open. Like, I think I'm going to be a bar owner at this point. And I watched this guy who I know and, and had defined in my head as like, this is JC, and this is what he does, this is what he likes. I know who JC is. And he completely changed. He added something to his quiver, put another arrow back there where he's like, now I own a geek bar, which made him turn into like, now I have to be a programmer. Now I have to learn this. Now, so he developed all these different sets of skills and built this amazing business. And so we started doing Fat Man on Batman at the bar. First time I did it, I fell in love with the space. I was like, oh my God, like this is a bar where nobody's ever gonna shit face and punch somebody else in the face. They'll fight. They'll fight about like Star Wars or Star Trek or stupid shit like that, but they'll never be like fisticuffs. Like this, this is an ideal space to hang out. So I started hitting JC up going like, can I buy into the bar? And he was like, well, we're already set, you know? And I'm like, all right, well, if there's ever a moment where I can buy in, like, let me know. I, I would love to be able to add to my portfolio or be able to say, like, oh, and I co own a bar in Hollywood. Like, that was never part of the plan, you know what I'm saying? So, like, suddenly I'm way more interested in that. So, hopefully, that's gonna happen soon. Hopefully, I'll be a, a co owner of, of the bar. That's the all, honestly, the only thing since the heart attack where I was like, I think I'd like to do that. Like, I think I'd, I'd like to be a, a middle-aged, way more overweight Sam Malone with a baseball cap. Like, it's, that'd be fun. It's so funny. Um, I want to I want to jump into a few other things, uh, but it's funny that us nerds and geeks, what our priorities are, because I would never own, like, a Ferrari, but the idea of being a co-owner of a geek bar, oh, that is appealing. Doesn't that feel like, I mean, like, think about it. We were raised with, you know, everybody knows your name and stuff like that. The idea of a space for us, but, like, let's be honest, most places you go out to drink, like, you know, they're not as welcoming, you know, and sometimes Completely. you feel like, I don't want to go there. That seems like incredibly hip or whatever the fuck. I love going into that space. I love uh, scum and villainy because it just feels like everybody's welcome. And it's also like Instagram clickbait. Like no matter where you take a picture, it's good. By the way, how does it work? Shit, man, I did not mean to go on this tangent, but how go does ahead. it work with like, did he have to license this? Like, how does no, this? No, because it's, well, number one, nobody owns the word scum and villainy, right? Sure. Well, you'd be surprised with Lucas. It's crazy. <laughs> I know. And they are. They've got the power of Disney behind them. Um, Cantina is a word that existed long before those movies as well. And when you go into the space, while it's incredibly suggestive or reminiscent, nothing is accurate. Got like, it. Got like it. if you look at the tables... It's, it's not those tables. Most importantly, and this, this is what I really enjoyed, they got like this kind of uh, hang, thing hanging over the bar, a series of pipes and what got like these, what looked like robot heads in them. And if you know the movies, you're like, well, shit, man, that sure looks like IG-88's head. That looks like a lot of IG-88's heads. And 
technically I guess it is, but they built IG88 out of like like a Rolls Royce fucking transmission or, or muffler, and that's what it is. So they just got a bunch of mufflers from cars, hung them up, and it, it's like homage, but it doesn't it doesn't touch on it. And, and very much so. And got he's it. been very careful about that because like dude don't want to get shut down. No, no, completely. So he's very, it's it's reminiscent, but like you know, I I don't think a lawyer could could come out of there and go like, we got a case. I think they'd be like, no, they're fans. I've been playing a, a game with a lot of people recently. It's called Random Questions. Okay. I'm going to try to breeze through this with you. Okay. Here we go. Uh, what TV show would you want to do a guest spot on? Um, Rick and Morty. Uh, do you have a favorite? So I got that. For, I got a mmm <laughs> from, from the peanut gallery. Thank you for that. Uh, do you, and I think I know the answer, but do you have a favorite sci-fi or fantasy film? Um, yes. I mean, yeah. I mean, I guess in, in the grand scheme of things, if I had to narrow it down to one, obviously I'm a big fan of the genre. Uh, Empire Strikes Back, I think, is a perfect film. Uh, what film scared you as a kid? Um, let's see. The Shining, the two little girls uh, holding hands when Danny rounds the corner. The whole movie doesn't terrify me, although it's unsettling as hell. But for a long time, that was my kryptonite. I uh, couldn't look at them. Even as an adult, it's still like, ugh. Uh, that's that was hard for me. Most other movies I could cognize as like, well, I was fucking fake. But I was a Catholic kid, right? So any devil movies were a little on the tougher side because we believed in that stuff. So The Exorcist we weren't allowed to see for a while. But one movie that I absolutely was terrifying to me, particularly Last Image, Race with the Devil. Remember this movie for, with Warren Oates and Peter Fonda? Vaguely. Um, they go uh, camping and riding dirt bikes and then they stumble across an occult killing in the woods and the, the, sat the satanic cult then chases their Winnebago across the Midwest or wherever it plays out. And um, it, you know, it's a movie that you wouldn't do today because at one point they have to stop at the library to look up information about Satanists. <laughs> you know, clearly today they'd be like, Satanists. So at the end, the ter Crimson Image, they escape and you know, they're in the clear and shit, they get away from the cult. And you know, there's a moment of like, woo, we did it and everybody's feeling great. And then all of a sudden they cut to this exterior shot of the camper and a fucking like ring of fire lights up around it and the cultists are still there and they're like, no. And for a young Catholic kid, it was just like, that's why you don't fuck with the devil, even if you have a camper, because they'll get you and shit. So that was terrifying to me as a child, as a young Catholic. Uh, what do you still collect? What do I still collect? Um, I recently, uh, let me see. I mean, I don't, I, now I've started to recollect pieces of my childhood. I'm at that age now where it's just like, oh shit, this is important to have. Uh, I unearthed a bunch of stuff in a tub that was in storage of toys that I had when I was a kid um, that were pre-Star Wars. Anything pre-Star Wars now figures prominently for me because I'm like, you know, once Star Wars came in, I became you, a Star Wars do kid. You, when you're buying it now, do you buy it with just the, have the action figure or do you need to have the packaging and the whole thing? But I'll st I stay away from that. What I buy, for example, is uh, I bought on eBay recently the Snoopy uh, hand soap dispenser that I had as a kid. It was plastic. Snoopy was sitting on top of his doghouse and it said clean hands inspector. And you pumped it and powder would come out, which you mixed with water to make soap. So I, I was like, you know, I thought about it a couple of month, a month ago or something. I was like, fuck, I haven't seen that in forever. And I looked for it, couldn't find it. And I was like, you know where I could find it. And I went to eBay and found it. And then I also found this toy set that I had, McDonaldland's play set, not Fisher Price, but Play School made it. Their characters were square. And it was a McDonald's. And it had staff that had little caps on, it had trays and, and people could sit down at tables. It was crazy because when you look at it now, you're like, this is a toy that's also a commercial. Completely. But there was a figure in it and the figure, I use the word loosely. They were like, uh, like the Fisher Price adventure people size kind of thing but they were square. And I had this little guy who was a McDonald's employee with a blue cap and shit like that. Uh, he was my uh, whoopee blanket when I was a kid. When I was five, five to six, I carried this fucker around everywhere. Like, couldn't be without it. He was my fucking magic feather. So I saw it recently and, and I was like, oh fuck, my little man, I called him, my little man. And so I bought the play set, you know, just to get that little guy, put him up on the shelf and stuff. There's two shelves in my office now that are just like, it looks like my room when I was a kid. And, and, not, <laughs> and not in a really like grow up kind of way, but like, oh, there's the Snoopy Stunt Spectacular, which was like Snoopy and Woodstock on this little plastic motorcycle. You ramp it back and then you vroom, vroom, it makes a noise. And then you release it. It's just like, you know, fucking 
elastic and it shoots the car across the room and shit. These were, that's how I learned to play. Like it's, it's, it's a celebration or an homage to like what made me creative. Like, you know, initially, how do we learn to be creative? Um, in my generation, prior to my generation, you know, kids just use their imagination. When we, we were kids, they gave us toys and like even the Star Wars toys, which you would imagine is limiting to the imagination because they're like, well, fucking, you can only play Star Wars. But what you do is play a version of Star Wars, tell a Star Wars story. Or not even tell a Star Wars story. You take the figures with like Lego and it's a whole new world. In a different place altogether. Yeah. So it did create imaginative play. And that led to, oh, I like make and pretend. And one day that aggregates to, I think I'll try writing. What I found really interesting lately is a lot of showrunners in this town, this generation of showrunners, played a lot of D&D &D when they were kids. That's something that didn't exist like for the people that wrote Mary Tyler Moore and shit like that. They didn't have this communal like, oh, when I was a kid, I used to sit around and tell stories with my friends, make up whole stories playing D&D. &D. Now this generation that runs whole fucking TV shows and stuff like that, a lot of their training came from just sitting around as kids going like, all right, so you come into the tunnel and there's a fucking orc there. And then you've got, you know, this, this, and this. That's what they do when they build like a TV show. They get a writer's room, they blue sky it and sit around and go like, all right, well, what if they did this, this and this and stuff? So I don't know, recently, maybe because of the heart attack, I've become enamored of the notion of these are the instruments that taught me to eventually become the person I would become. It's important to put them up. This belongs in a museum. You know, like in, uh, when the Star Wars figures got the new versions for Empire, they had the sticker, mm -hmm. you know, like collect to get the Boba Fett, whatever. Yes. The, the toys that uh, you were buying right now uh, have bonus stickers that say, now with mercury and lead. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is probably why I had a heart attack years fucking later. You know so what I mean? All those poison toys. Do you remember uh, Power of the Force Star Wars? Of, of course. Where they were like, 84. Now it's a coin, and you're like, Oh shit. Oh, completely. I had no idea this was real currency. Um, I'm running out of time with you. Okay. In fact, I'm probably need to wrap up. So I'm going to breeze through these. Totally. Um, what TV show or movie props do you own? Uh, what, I mean, any props I own generally are from stuff I've done. I've never really gone. That's what I'm curious. Did you buy other people's, other people's stuff? No, a friend of mine, Dave Mandel, who runs Veep, uh, we worked on the cartoon years ago, the clerk's cartoon. And Dave's a big collector. He's got a lot of original artwork. There's an exhibit in Seattle right now at that, uh, the pop museum there, a Marvel exhibit that has a lot of Dave's pages on display because he bought the original artwork and stuff. Years ago, when we were working on the Clerks cartoon, he showed me a Stormtrooper helmet. And he goes, this is from, uh, episode, from episode four. This is from A New Hope. And I was like, get the fuck out of here. And it was breathtaking. But it looked exactly like the Stormtrooper helmet that I could go buy down the street if I really wanted to. And I was like, how much was this? And he was like, 25000 <gasps> So that the collecting game is way out of my range. Now, since I make movies, I can walk away with some of the props for Kevin Smith movies. Completely. Which don't have as much value in the world, but they do to me more sentimental value. Than I think. Background photo on your phone. Background photo on my phone is a picture of me and my wife in Disneyland holding hands, uh, taken from behind. My kid took the picture. Um, and, you know, I'm wearing a jersey, so it's a Smith on the back. And, and uh, my, my kid was... Uh, she said, You're, you guys are cute, you look like the number 10, because my wife is thin and I'm not. So it, it's on my phone. <laughs> uh, what TV show have you watched uh, all the way through more than once? Oh, wow, what a great question. Um, news radio, I've, I've seen every episode repeatedly I've gone through, and that's not a show that you need to watch episodically and stuff. Generally speaking, the shows that, like, man, you got it, you're on a journey, like Game of Thrones. As much as I love Game of Thrones, there are key moments that I'll rewatch, but I've never been like, I'm gonna watch that whole season again. I, I think that will have, I think for a lot of us with Game of Thrones, because it's incredible. I think when the show ends, if they if they hit the landing, yes. it's, it has to be we'll a rewatch. We'll do the big sit, yeah, yeah at that it, point. It has to be a rewatch. What movie have you watched the most in your life besides Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back? What movie have I watched the most? All right, let me go through my my top five. Because right? we are totally pushing out of time. Totally. So uh, I'm gonna Jaws, kill me. JFK, Do the Right Thing, Last Temptation of Christ, and a man for all seasons. I would say probably those I've watched the most. I mean, uh, definitely, and this sounds gross, but I, the real answer is my movies by virtue of the fact that I'm the editor. So you see over and over again. I go to every test screening and shit like that. So if you think you hate Kevin Smith movies, fucking join me one day. Um, so my movies the most, but something that I didn't make, this is gonna be a weird answer. And, and you know, nobody gonna see it coming. The talented Mr. Ripley. 
Ooh, that's a really good movie. It's a wonderful movie by Anthony Minghella and, and Matt and, and uh, Jude Law and Gwyneth Paltrow are fantastic in the flick. Uh, it became the go to sleep movie in my house for a long time. And that sounds insulting, but it's not. That's the highest place of honor. It's the movie that you are so absolutely fucking comfortable with that you put it on to go to sleep to. But you see, the problem I have is that like there's certain movies that come on and if it comes on, I just have to watch till the end. Like mm. Goodfellas comes on, it's two and a half hours the and I'm, I'm done. Yeah, that, that's one that I love and can go either way. So if you're watching it and you wind up being awake, it's great because it's Talented Mr. Ripley. But if you fall asleep, it's fine. You've seen Talented Mr. Ripley a number of times. Um, before I run the last thing for you, even though I had 50 other things, uh, if, when I put on Twitter, I was going to talk to you. A lot of people wanted to know, what are you actually working on right now? What's the status of the reboot? Uh, can you give an update? Jay and Silent Bob reboot, uh, I believe we start in October. August is our pre and stuff, and we start putting it together. So it looks like we start shooting in the fall. That is a sequel to Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, uh, a direct sequel, although years later and stuff like that. Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back is about... Jay and Silent Bob finding out that, you know, Hollywood is making a movie based on them, so they go to Hollywood and try to stop it. Jay and Silent Bob Reboot is, you know, 17 years later, so I'm a better storyteller, so it's a completely different movie. And Jay and Silent Bob Reboot, Jay and Silent Bob find out Hollywood making a reboot of that old movie that they made, and they have to go to Hollywood to stop it. It's the same fucking movie all over again. <laughs> Basically, I took the old script, and I was like, let me see if I change every other word, if I can get away with this. And that is kind of, like, there's a bit of a film school -y trick to that. I never, I went to film school, but I didn't get to be experimental as a filmmaker, right? Like, I made Clerks first out the gate, and suddenly I had a career and shit. So now, later, later, in life in my career that's where i'm getting experimental the fucking red state tusk yoga hosers and stuff like that jay and silent bob reboot like clearly those movies i'm uh, incredibly amused by them the rest of the world not so much so i'm gonna try to do what i've been doing but do it under the shell of the familiar and still i can't just make a movie anymore like i've done it a bunch i'm not saying like i'm good at it. it's just when you do something a bunch you just want to change each time you're like let me see if i could do it this way so the idea behind jay and silent bob reboot is kind of the idea behind Gus Van Sant's remake of Psycho, which a lot of people were like, this is unnecessary and fucking stupid. But it's like, what a ballsy experiment. Like Gus Van Sant at one point, with all the juice that he could possibly have in his career after Good Will Hunting, he went to Universal and was like, I would like to remake Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. And they're like, are you crazy? And he's like, here's my argument. Kids don't watch Psycho anymore because it's a black and white movie. It's a great story. And he's going, I've always wanted to see if I could do a shot for shot remake of that movie. And they were like, all right. And they gave him fucking 30 million bucks or whatever it was. And he went off and made it. And a lot of people got mad, but I was like, that's so ballsy. That's incredible. And not ballsy like I'm going to fucking play with Hitchcock's legacy. It doesn't affect Psycho. If you love Psycho, Psycho doesn't stop existing. But the idea of another filmmaker taking another filmmaker's film and seeing if he could do a shot for shot remake. And he was close. There was two shots he added. But the rest of it was pretty much like what, what Hitchcock did. You know, I know there's an argument for uh, like what a waste of time and money. I didn't think so. I thought it was cool. And it was, that's what he wanted to do, to do with his shot. He's like... I, this is the most power I'll ever have in my career. I want to try to do this. And he pulled it off. So for me, Jay and Silent Bob reboot is me going like, I just want to see if I can get away with making the same exact movie again with different names and different actors. But generally speaking, it is kind of shot for shot the same movie. I, I got to wrap, but what, who, uh, with financing, who's, yeah. who's making it? There, uh, I, 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 there are two entities involved right now and a third coming on. I can't say who the two entities are, but, but both of them are actually like known, like legit entities. Uh, you know, I, I kind of, I'm, I'm a, when you're a storyteller, you know, uh, in the visual medium and shit, you kind of look anywhere for, for money at the end of the day. And so I've looked some weird places uh, to find financing for my projects. The Rivet TV thing, I saw someone online, some, some website was like, Kevin Smith's doing something weird with this weird thing to make his new show or something. I don't think it's weird. I think it's creative. Like, I think it's like, if this works, somebody else will follow me and be like, hey, I want to try it. I got this fucking pilot that nobody ever saw, and I would like to put it together and stuff. Yeah, completely. I, I was talking before, uh, earlier, about the Rivet TV model, and the fact of the matter is, truthfully, say The Expanse didn't get picked up by a Amazon. Bang! Right? You could, if the showrunner could get the rights, Bang. they could go to Rivet TV and say, hey, um, we want to make season four. It will cost $60 million. Can we put it out there to people? And if they're willing, and if enough fans are willing to pay for it, they can make the show. It's, and in the case of Hollyweed, we don't need 60 million. <laughs> the Expanse definitely would. But that's the idea. The idea is like, look, 
why should this die just because like some networks like it's not for us you know it's there's an audience for everything and then niche marketing thank god over the course of the last 10 years has taken off in a big bad way where people understand micro is not bad like it used to be if you don't get everybody fuck it what's the point but now it's like you don't need everybody man you need laser focused like audience of a thousand you can make something work you can make a go of something they have shows on cable that are getting under a million viewers and they're still coming back right and you know T comic book man for for seven seasons we've just got canceled this year but seven seasons, man, like we were at late night, you know, on like a, sometimes one in the morning, the, the show would air after walking and talking dead. And we were pulling like a really solid number of like a million per episode and stuff. That was like more than some like late night yes. talk shows and stuff. And granted, we were following the walking dead and stuff. So there's an audience for everything. If you could connect with them and we're using technology to connect with them through River TV. Maybe you get to do that thing, you know? So I'm, I'm happy to try. If it doesn't work, so be it. But I, I think it'll work. Yeah, um, a million other things that I'll ask you about for the next time. Okay. Kevin Smith, thank you so much for coming in. So good. To, now, now I'm glad I know where the place is. Now right. I know how to get here. I'll be back in a heartbeat. Yeah, I was going to say, we started with Schmodown. We're going to end with Schmodown. I'm going to work on getting him on it. Uh, seriously, thanks so much for no coming in. Hey, everybody. Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode. You want to watch more? Then click up here. Or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. If you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.